Inclusiveness is essential for addressing the scientific and societal challenges that face humanity and our planet. Joining us now to talk about the AGU's ongoing efforts is AGU President Lisa Gromlich. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Laura. It's really great to be here with you. What does AGU's 2023 theme, Wide Open Science, mean to you? I love this theme this year, Wide Open Science. You know, often I say Earth and Space Sciences is the teamiest of team science. And to me, the wide open science theme completely supports that assertion. So what is wide open science? To me, it is global engagement for two reasons. One is for the purpose of research as well as ensuring that our results are not just usable but used, particularly when we think about access to research and research results for communities that have historically been excluded from science. Why wide open science? Well, two things. It accelerates discovery and it ensures that the benefits for all people are optimized. So, Let's think about wide open science. How do we actually do this? How does AGU as a professional association deliver on this promise, on this aspiration of wide open science? There's a couple of key things. The bedrock of our work is, of course, peer-reviewed publications. And recall, we've got 23 journals. And at this point, 12 of the 23 journals are open access. Half of the articles published by AGU are open to the entire public on the moment in which they're published. Now, this comes with a changing business model for publication, and I want to make sure people understand that, yes, there are page charges, and there are waivers and discounts and other funding options. Never let the fees associated with open access stop you from submitting and publishing in an AGU journal. What else does it mean? Well, something that is newer for us than our decades and decades of publications is the Thriving Earth Exchange. Thriving Earth Exchange is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. It is a way in which our scientists engage with communities to co-create, to work hand in hand with those communities to define research questions, that are relevant to the community and ensure that the community then can use those research results to enact better policies, to create better practices, and to alert people to the kinds of environmental issues that they may be facing. I'm really proud of the Thriving Earth Exchange. It has grown to over 250 programs. We started in the United States, but it has gone global. Well, and then Lastly, when we think about wide open science, we can just simply think about the meeting we're at right now. There are over 25,000 people attending, either virtually or in person here in San Francisco. People are coming from over 100 different countries, and it's a time in which we actually put into practice wide open science. And if we're to look back at 2023, what are some of AGU's biggest accomplishments? The work we're doing on the ethical framework for climate intervention, research, experimentation, and deployment. What's that about? As climate change and the climate crisis becomes more and more pressing for us, we are looking for solutions that at times could involve major interventions in the climate system, like geoengineering or carbon dioxide removal and storage and big scale technologies where investments are being made and the question is, who makes the decision about which investments are made and how they are deployed and what kind of research underlies those decisions? We have assembled a global committee of experts in this area. And once again, global in its scope. And it's not just the scientists. It's policymakers, it's ethicists, it's people that are very attuned to the role of technology in society. And we are working together to create a framework of principles that would govern experimentation, research, and deployment. I'm very proud of the work here. To me, it is 
another part of wide open science where we are thinking about the complete impact of the way in which our science is deployed, either now or potentially in the future, around the world. One of the things that's particularly meaning for me is that I have been working with AGU senior staff to ensure that we have a presence globally. I just got back from the 60th anniversary of the Indian Geophysical Union, a wonderful meeting held in India where the science that was presenting was so exciting, super sophisticated work, and the number of young early career and student researchers that presented and were honored by the IGU was incredible. So the, to me, our accomplishments have been not only kind of doing our business as usual of publications and fabulous meetings, but ensuring that we really are creating and engaging with a global community of scientists and practitioners around the world. What is AGU doing to support the next generation of scientists? Well, when I think about the next generation of scientists, I actually have to hearken back <laughs> when I was part of that next generation of scientists and what AGU meant to me. So indulge me in a quick story, and I'm sure some of the early career people can relate to this. There's the thrill of getting your first big grant. For me, it was an NSF grant to work with Chinese colleagues up on the Tibetan Plateau. And I had a couple of days of elation, and then a couple of very, very hard weeks of realizing that there were ways that this very early collaboration with Chinese colleagues had all sorts of complications. And as an early career person, frankly, I didn't quite know what I was doing. I turned to people like Dr. Lonnie Thompson, who of course had decades of work in this area, and I knew him through AGU. And I could not have had the success I had had it not been for my AGU network of people that were senior scientists but very willing to help me as an early career person. I hope for all of you early career people listening to this video that you, you take my example seriously and when you find yourself in that place where you really don't quite know how you're going to pull off the ambitious thing that you aspire to, that you turn to more senior people knowing that this is what this community is all about. So what are we, as an organization, what are we doing? I am very proud of our publication, EOS, and the way in which we not only publish research summaries, but we're really about trying to make sure people can have careers that are fulfilling. So look back. Just a couple of issues ago, there was an entire issue devoted to the wide variety of careers that Earth and Space Sciences, training in the Earth and Space Sciences can lead you towards. Um, I mentioned earlier about mentoring. That, I was on some level just lucky to be able to connect with Dr. Lonnie Thompson. We now have a way through Mentoring 365, our virtual year-round mentoring program, that if you have a question, it could be a small technical question or it could be some career questions you have that might need a sort of longer enduring engagement, we can connect you with a mentor. And this is a worldwide program because it's virtual. And I hope you'll look into that. Once again, small questions, big questions, everything in between we can work with. I think an important part for the next generation of scientists is the degree to which we are taking diversity, equity, and inclusion seriously as a cultural issue. And with our NSF-funded project landing, we are creating opportunities for culture change champions, and I'm very excited about those programs. Be sure and check those out. So while you're here at AGU 23, I urge you to You've got to go to your scientific sessions, of course, and you're going to meet with colleagues, but please, please, please take advantage of the wide variety of opportunities we have. Everything from like getting a headshot to, you know, talking with people about publication opportunities. Do engage with the full range of benefits you have from being an AGU member. Thank you, Lisa, for making time to be with us today. I hope the week ahead is a great one. It's been a pleasure.